And good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk on this Wednesday, March 16th. Thank you so much for joining us, making us part of your day once again. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Find us online, markettalkag.com. That is our home on the web, markettalkag.com, where you can find us. All of our streaming sources, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, much more there, along with all of our social media links, the latest news of agriculture, and much more. It's all at markettalkag.com. Well, we had a pretty uh, big down day in the wheat market today. Corn and beans followed along as well at the Fed meeting wrapping up here today. Just a lot of things to discuss on our plate in the world of agriculture. Let's talk about it. Bring in our good friend Mike Zuzalo, Global Commodity Analytics, joins us today. Mike, great to have you back on, sir, for uh, another Wednesday and, and plenty to talk about. How are you today? Doing great, Jesse. Thanks for having me back, sir. Well, let's dive right in, Mike. Uh, a lot of things to discuss. I think just uh, kind of to start off, down day in the wheat. I know there's rumors of peace talks with Russia, Ukraine, whether or not that happens, but it just felt like maybe some of the computers just kind of took over today and drove us sharply lower, and that pulled corn with, and eventually soybeans kind of followed suit as well today, Mike. Yeah, I think you hit on the nose, and it's funny how we never really talk about the markets before we go on air, but yeah, you smell these things out and sense these things out very appropriately. I think it, it, it was a day, I think, Jesse, where I would classify it as funds versus fundamentals, and it's something we really want to keep tabs on here because we did do some technical damage in terms of taking out some trend lines in the corn market and the new crop corn. We made some new lows in the wheat market. And uh, that those limit down moves, when they close limit down, it tends to build up some momentum to the side of the uh, market that the limit is on. And so we'll have to really watch this closely. But to kind of pair it out, I feel as though that in the morning, the market ahead of the Zelensky speech to the U.S. Congress um, really had in its mindset that we were going to see a real peace deal and a neutrality agreement being carved out between the Ukrainians and the Russians and not, it wasn't just all the wheat. We also saw the, the Baltic index and a lot of the world freight indices dropped dramatically. We saw the dollar drop dramatically as it didn't need to be a safe haven anymore. We saw the stock market rally sharply. We saw gold and silver down dramatically. So I felt like in most of the financial and commodity markets, everybody was breathing a sigh of relief in the futures market and the fund community thinking in the investment mindset that we are going to get back to normalcy and normalcy and get back to normality. <clears throat> I, I caution the, the listener and the viewer on that at this stage of the game, however, because we really don't see any movement whatsoever in terms of peace. In fact, after the Zelensky speech, when he said we need more help, remember Pearl Harbor, we give him drones and then we go ahead and see that Zelensky is telling us to, um, give him a no-fly zone still. And then the Wall Street Journal reported that the Ukrainians were mounting a counteroffensive. And so between that and some of the other things that are going on out there, practically speaking, we're not going back to normalcy. The normality is not returning as far as I see it. And at the same time, the Russians are bombing the heck out of Kiev. And so I think that funds maybe got ahead of themselves. Um, one other thing that is is sincerely a fundamental instead of a fund or investment driver in the wheat market in particular, is that both the weather models, the GFS and the Euro, turn much wetter, and it's like much wetter right now. In other words, the end of the week all the way into the end of the month looks like two, three, maybe even four inches of rain in some of the driest areas of not just the hard red wheat belt, but the western corn belt, including Iowa. So that is what I would say has a material uh, issue to contend with with this break and this pullback. Uh, on Wednesday with the wheat lead pullback. But I would say the other side of the coin is if there is no peace within the next week or two, we're going to have to go back and start talking about how the Ukrainians and the and the Russians are not going to get their new crop corn and, and, and oil seeds planted and barley planted. And then that in turn keeps the supplies that they do have from old crop held even more tightly and kept for their domestic market for an even longer period of time. So it's it's a real interesting feed negative feedback loop. If they don't get planted, what supplies they have are going to be become even more dear to them and they're going to hold off the world market. So this market is still in a situation where it could flip very quickly. I would say by the end of this month, as we get into the acreage report, I think the trade will feel like they know a lot more than they do right now. 
Many great points there, Mike, uh, with uh, everything tied to Russia, Ukraine, and you mentioned some of the weather and the rain and the forecast for some drought areas in the U.S. I want to kind of stay on the, on the Russia, Ukraine thing a little bit and, and kind of tie this into a couple charts that you sent me here today. We have charts for golf prices in the Baltic, and uh, I'll pull the golf one up first, and we'll pull the Baltic chart up as well. But uh, talk us through what you're thinking here and, and what you're looking at with some of these charts. Well, this is one of the premier charts you'll get to see a lot if you're a subscriber or if you're a client, Jesse. And what I did here was I took the CME futures price, which is the yellowish orange line, and I overlaid it with the New Orleans golf price for corn, which is the bright purple line. And I went all the way back to 2008 so we can see the difference in price and where we're at in price versus back in 08 and also in 11 and also in 12. And what you see in the purple line, which again is the cash market at the Gulf of Mexico, we have gone up to 2012 price levels at this point in, in, the, in the cash market, whereas the futures market has not gotten to that price level uh, at this stage of the game. And this suggests to me that A, we are rationing demand at this point because the cash is so far ahead of where the futures market is. But then you can flip that over a little bit and, and I would suggest to producers that because of this chart, because this is from the Brookings Institute and the World Bank republished this just today because I missed it last week when it was published by Brookings. World Bank just republished it today and it shows very clearly when you're looking at vegetable oils and corn, not so much wheat, but the, the, the yellow bars are Ukrainian exports going to the world. And, and uh, it's a really significant number when it comes to the, both the corn and the vegetable oils. And so this is where it goes back to if we don't get Ukraine planted and Russia planted, then that futures market is probably going to need to go up to where the cash market is on that previous chart. And so this sets up a situation where the cash market has the premium in it right now. The futures has the discount in it right now. Maybe the futures guys and the funds know in the future something that the cash market doesn't. But I don't think so. And I think this is really could be telling that you'd want to go ahead and let go of your cash bushels, especially for like old crop corn, and really go after re-ownership on the futures. Because to me, percentage wise, it would make sense futures needs to run up to where that closer to where that golf price is. So that's some of the dynamics we're looking at here as we get ready to plant here in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, Mike, as well, uh, one other chart you sent me today, you know, everyone's talking about energy prices, gas, oil, et cetera. And, and walk us through this, what you're seeing here, because we have seen oil prices come down in recent days, still very high, but I know that's just one factor that's out there that people are talking about in the market. So walk us through this chart a little bit. Yeah, I'm really glad you framed it that way because this is a really great in indicator too from a standpoint that the energy market is the ultimate cash versus futures. I mean, look at the crude oil market and the futures this past two weeks, Jesse, we've corrected 30% plus and yet the gasoline prices are not bending at all. The diesel prices are not bending at all. So again, we're really keeping that cash premium intact. Now this chart, and this is something that I talk to clients and subscribers about at length and something you can tap into again, if you work with me, I won't go through all the nitty gritty details, but the circled area is the debt crisis from the late seventies, early eighties. That's when we had that terrible interest rate hike from Paul Volcker to tame that terrible inflation. It was the best medicine, but it was the worst medicine to have to take. It threw us into a pretty significant recession for a couple of years. And it has not been since 1979, 1980 that we've had uh, energy prices, the costs as a percent of global GDP as high as they are, as they were back in that time period of 79, 80. So they're hitting 15% of global GDP in terms of energy costs in, in the world. And that's where we were back during that time period. I think this is a major feature as to why the Federal Reserve only raised their rates a quarter point today by an eight to one vote. And, and they spoke specifically about Ukraine. They spoke specifically about the Ukrainian war being an issue for giving us higher inflation for longer and also hurting the economic uh, recovery and, and probably pulling down GDP. And they did cut U.S. GDP pretty dramatically in their update today. But I would say that this is the, the kind of synthesis of cost push inflation where energy prices and commodity prices due to supply issues, weather issues, 
come in and take such a bite out of your profitability that it leads you into recession. So had the, the Federal Reserve come in and raised by 50 or even 75 basis points today, I think that would have been a real negative feature and probably would have driven us into a recession and driven us into stagflation instead of pure inflation. So I like what they did today simply because of this chart. Well, Mike, uh, you know, you mentioned the Fed here today and uh, getting some of those numbers out. What do you think? Is there going to be any impact on on grain trade overnight into tomorrow? Is there anything we need to watch out for? Yeah, there should be. If you look at the idea of what we just talked about, then the Federal Reserve is backing off trying to be the, the lion slayer of inflation. They're going to take a more steady approach because they realize the type of inflation we're dealing with, Jesse. It's not demand pull. It's it's cost push. And so if that's the case, then the dollar should not need to go any higher because bond yields and interest rates shouldn't need to go any higher in the treasury market. And so this takes the pressure off the dollar from being bought, takes it off from being bought from a safe haven and from a standpoint of the Federal Reserve. So the dollar should correct here, which is an inflationary gauge. Uh, add to that the idea that if the Federal Reserve is going to kind of be slower about this situation, then the funds and the investors should realize that inflation is going to hang around longer and therefore they keep their commodity investments at a five, six, seven percent of their holdings instead of drawing it down again, uh, like what they did, you know, before 2020, 2021. So my sense is the dollar should go down, the bonds should go higher, and that would push the yields lower. Now, after the, the Federal Reserve came out this afternoon, that was not happening. The dollar was firming. The bonds were weakening and pushing bond yields up. But that's something to look for here between now and the end of the week to see if that dollar weakens, bonds strengthen, strengthens, and then that causes the commodity bulls to come back in with an inflationary bias. Any final thoughts in the grain market today, Mike, before we move to livestock, uh, anything South America-wise, or I know as well, some of our southern states, we're starting to see some planters roll already, Mike. Yeah, one thing that came out late in the session was Allendale's figures for the acreage base. They came in at 92.4 on corn and 89.3 on beans, and they blew the doors off of the USDA on both corn and beans. I I know that the um, the the profitability is and the price action would suggest that farmers are just going to plant more and more and more and more. But coming right back from prime e, central corn belt country, right on the Indiana Illinois border, 20 minutes from Champaign, Illinois last week. I don't see that yet, Jesse. I think I think the farmers are way too nervous to take the chance, given the diesel prices especially, and given Mother Nature. And so if we would see this wetter pattern develop in the early part of the spring and take pressure off of the western corn belt, maybe then we would start to see a little bit more eagerness to go ahead and plant higher acres with the idea that that fertilizer they put into the ground is going to do some good because right now it's just not going to do any good in some of these droughty areas. So between that and the diesel prices, I just have a hard time getting above 91 million on the corn acres right now. And I still feel as though the corn and bean acres are pretty close to that 90, 91 million each. Mike, let's talk livestock and looking at cattle futures. Uh, feeder cattle today, we'll call it mixed to higher. Live cattle were lower. You know, you look at feedlot country and uh, feedlots, they're they're holding strong. They want their full asking price this week. Packers want to get cattle bought cheaper. Uh, what do you see with these cattle markets, especially on a day today where, you know, grains were sharply lower and stocks were a little bit higher? Were you surprised we were a little more mixed on the trade today? Not really, because it was a fun day. You know, like we talked about in the grains and what was going on in the outside markets, it had the footprint of the funds. We saw the pork and bean trade very active. Both of those were higher in terms of hogs and soybeans. So that's a fun trade. The feeder corn ratio was very active in the spread. And I think also, Jesse, the, the problem with the cash market for the cattle right now, while we have very strong exports, and that's going to be another key again to how the packers come in, at the end of this week is to see where we're at on Thursday morning's export sales. I, I continue to feel as though the cattle, while the packer was probably short bought last week and the week before, I suspect they're starting to get caught up on their purchases and they're really gunning after the pork side of the equation. Pork to fill the void from lost poultry supplies because of HPAI, which I think is happening right now. I was surprised to see in the, I checked the Walmart here in town online to try and buy some meat in my uh, shopping cart out of almost every cut of poultry, out of, out of almost every cut of chicken at this point. So I think the Packers are going to have to substitute pork for chicken because of that price point. And I think because of the Easter seasonal, 
the Packers going to want to go after the, the pork as much as they possibly can and, and maybe walk away from beef just because of the high consumer prices. Having said that, if we have a good week in the pork and the, and the Packers come in and buy and the, and the ham cutout can go up and the pork cutout can go up, then I think those feedlots may be able to get close to what they want. But right now, I would say, I guess I feel like for the first time in maybe two or three months, the packer has more of the edge than the feedlot does or the cattle rancher does right now. Well, and segueing over to the hog side uh, on your points there a little bit, you know, the hog market last couple sessions, we were sharply higher Friday, but then, you know, last couple of days, we've just been kind of mixed. So summer months have been a little bit higher and really just the demand for a shrinking supply of hogs. It, it continues to maybe support this market a little bit. Um, but what are your thoughts here? You know, we've also seen demand wane a little bit, maybe overseas in some spots, but obviously with that substitution of pork for chicken, uh, poultry products, I mean, what are your thoughts with this hog market moving forward? Are we going to go retest some highs possibly in this market? If we are, I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. And, and a couple of things there that you made me think of is one thing that I think is maybe going to hurt our export pace here on Thursday's export sales is the high shipping costs, not just the shipping itself, but the insurance that the the shippers are making you take. And because just because of what's going on between Ukraine and Russia, it seems like it's everywhere that the shipping costs are going higher. So I think the net volume is going to be down because of that. Each load is just that much more expensive. So if I'm right about that, Jesse, then that means there's a little bit more of a back flush of supply into the domestic market. And if that's the case, then your prime time for the Easter seasonal is really coming up right now because we're getting close to the third week of Lent. We know that the Lent is about five or six weeks. So we're halfway through the Easter buying seasonal, getting ready for Easter Sunday. So I would say the next seven to 10 days are absolute keys to the pork being bought up by the packer. And if that's the case, then I think a rising tide can lift all boats. The beef side can go up, the cattle side can go up, and, and, the, and the poultry side can go up as well. But uh, I would say 10 days from now, if we don't see a really strong hog market and a real strong purchasing level by the packers, then we might have to settle in for a little bit more of a sideways to lower trade. Well, Mike, great stuff as always. Floor is yours. Any final thoughts on this Wednesday? I would say the amount of volume of research that I'm pushing out right now, it'd, it'd be really worth getting a, a one month trial and trying to to do that, you know, for a small amount of money. A normal a normal subscription is around four hundred and eighty five dollars, including a text blast. Otherwise, it's around four hundred dollars. I would be happy to do a, a, a three month trial or a one month trial. Just give us a call or go to globalcomresearch.com and and sign up and let me call and have me give you a call and we can discuss what your needs are because I think this is a time to really step up your marketing plan with this volatility. Again, that website, globalcomresearch.com. That is globalcom with two M's, research.com. You can get a hold of Mike Zuzalo and get some advice and get some analysis from him on your marketing plan. Mike, appreciate the time as always. Thanks for joining us on Market Talk this week, sir. Have a great one. We'll talk to you next week. You too, Jesse. Thanks so much. Mike Zuzalo, Global Commodity Analytics, our guest today on Market Talk. Find us online, markettalkag.com. This has been the Wednesday, March 16th edition of the show. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.